Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of interactions or interacting with people. I toy around with the title, sometimes I call it, call it managing interpersonal uh, interactions. But the basic premise is that learning some of the subtle cues, the subtle social cues and best practices about interacting with other people is important to us in life and it's another one of those areas that I like to cover because even though it's very important it's something that we don't get a lot of formal education regarding it's not really covered as a topic of study in most educational curriculums so curricula so the uh, way I've structured it today is I want to talk about the good the bad and the ugly so it's gonna be the good habits that you should adopt, some of the bad habits that you should avoid that even well-meaning people can oftentimes slip into. And the ugly is about identifying and managing interactions where people are really uh, hostile to you, either explicitly or even more importantly, subtly manipulative, sort of trying to uh, uh, put on uh, 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 wolf in sheep's clothing, as they say. And we'll talk about how to deal with that. And the last one is sort of some philosophical, uh, questionable areas. You know, should you, uh, how should you manage this? What is the right thing to do? And so we'll get into some of the gray areas there. So to begin with, let's start out by talking about some of the good habits. And the, one of the most important things you can do is learn about the art of conversation. And this is where you want you in, in, learn to engage in a conversation and get something from it for yourself, but also make a contribution to uh, the others engaged as well. You, the person you're talking to, maybe the people listening, um, you, wanna, you wanna sort of manage that effectively. And I'll give you a couple of tips here for the sample. One of them is you can easily fall into a trap where introverts don't make enough of a contribution and extroverts try and make the conversation all about themselves. They try and keep drawing attention back to themselves. And those are sort of mistakes you can make on either extreme. What you really wanna do is recognize that it is not a competition, but rather a cooperation. A conversation is all about um, making sure that everybody is heard fairly. And you wanna bring people into the conversation if you feel they've been left out, perhaps you redirect to them and ask them a question. Um, you also wanna take a sincere interest in the others and uh, you want to keep the conversation going, but it's important to note that you shouldn't panic if there's a pause, that's a natural thing. Pauses happen every few minutes in a naturally occurring conversation. Um, also, part of the art of conversation, but I thought it was important enough to get its own, uh, its own bullet point, you want to ask others about what they think, ask them about themselves. Generally speaking, people like to tell their story. Um, you'll certainly learn more from listening to them than you will telling them about yourself and uh, sort of gets back to the middle ground between introversion and extroversion. Um, the next point I wanted to make was uh, you, you want to understand the importance of saving what's called face, uh, which means allowing people to not be embarrassed if there's a disagreement or if they turn out to be wrong or something. And I will give you an example of this. So for example, if someone says something that you disagree with, rather than challenging it explicitly, like that's not true or you're wrong about that, you might ask them, uh, uh, you might present contrary evidence as a question. Well, what about this? Or how do you feel that that, uh, do you feel that the, the fact X, Y, Z um, somehow uh, interacts with your premise A, B, C? And that's a much more subtle way that challenges them while allowing them to save face. In other cultures, this is a, a particularly um, important and sensitive area. Like uh, when Americans do business in Asia, we don't tend to place a great priority on that. In Asia, they very much do. Another point I wanted to talk about under good habits is to learn how to make compliments and how to give criticism. Um, I'm gonna talk here about giving them, but you should also, uh, there's also things to be said about uh, receiving as well in the live presentation. Um, one, one good best practice is that you want to, uh, if you're talking to someone, you wanna compliment them in public. So that allows them to uh, have a reputation that is enhanced. And if you wanna criticize them, you will generally wanna criticize them privately to allow them to save face. Uh, another thing is if you're giving feedback to somebody at work, it's always good to start with the compliments, the things that you feel they're doing right, before you enter into something that you feel that they're doing wrong or could be done better. Because that will sort of soften the blow and it will help prevent conflict. Now, what do you do if someone is intent on causing a conflict or if you find it unavoidable? Well, there are a variety of practices. One of them is you can actually engage them in a conflict. But it's important to note that you, you don't want to uh, 
have the terms of that engagement, that interaction, defined by them. So for example, if they start raising their voice, it's the natural reaction is to respond in kind by raising your voice. But oftentimes you will enhance your own position and certainly if there's an audience there by, by lowering your voice. And likewise, if they speak quickly, you try and slow them down. This has a couple of advantages. One of them, psychologically, it demonstrates that they don't control you. Um, second of all, it, it can uh, uh, play to the audience, if you will, and, and re show, demonstrates the audience that you're not interested in, ex in uh, increasing the level of conflict. Um, but those are, there are also a lot of other options. One is you can just drop the subject, sort of ignore that it happened. You can dodge it by, uh, by deflecting it. You can delay, so for example, if this isn't necessarily one personal interaction, but a series in the workplace, sometimes if you put off, you know, you don't wanna uh, put off something that makes it worse, but sometimes putting it off, it'll resolve itself, somebody else gets moved, um, somebody else makes a decision about it, and you end up not having, you end up avoiding a fight that ultimately turned out to be unnecessary. Um, you can also change the subject. Um, you can also leave, and this is kind of a, a delicate balance because um, by leaving, you will be uh, clearly avoiding the conflict, but maybe you didn't think it was important enough to have. But also, now they're, they're, they, they might consider that a victory, and they might, uh, that might appear to be uh, so if there's an audience. Um, so it's a, it's a delicate balance. But the audience, if they're high-minded, might recognize that that's a high-minded attempt by you to avoid the conflict. So you have to know your audience a bit well there to know how that's gonna play. Um, Sting, in one of his songs, this might be an old English expression, I just didn't, he, that's just where I heard it. He said, uh, a gentleman will walk but never run, which means you will walk away from a conflict if you find it beneath you or unnecessary or this person not worth engaging, but you won't run away because that would imply that they have power over you and you fear them. So that's a sort of a delicate balance there from, from uh, a music lyric. So those are some good habits to adopt. Let's talk a little bit about some bad habits. Um, one of them is I always talk, it's easy to slip into a situation where your intention, or at least what you tell yourself is, I'm informing them, but in fact, you're bragging. So for example, if you tell them about how accomplished you are and all your business accomplishments, it's, it's very easy to uh, draw the conclusion that um, I'm just letting them know my credentials so that they will know what I'm capable of doing for them. But it's also possible that you might just end up showing off. You gotta walk that balance. It's easy to slip into. There's a motivational speaker I know of, I won't name his name, but he, he tends to sort of do everything under the premise of informing and what his presentation is mostly just him talking about all the amazing things he's done. And then at the end he sort of says, and if I can, you can too. And I think that this is, he's, he's creating the illusion that he's informing you, but in reality, this is just him indulging in his own impulse to brag. Um, another bad habit that you can adopt, um, oftentimes people try to be uh, critical about things to show off how, how aware or sophisticated their knowledge or tastes are. So you might say, well, you know, I was just pointing out that that's not how you're supposed to do things, or that's not how you're supposed to hold your fork, or that's not how you're, uh, uh, th you know, this is, I think this is a poorly run uh, organization or restaurant or whatever it is. And it's important to note that there's a delicate balance between being critical and uh, trying to sound superior. Um, another important bad habit to avoid is uh, I think it's sort of unfair to refuse people the uh, opportunity to defend themselves. So for example, if someone takes a cheap shot and then you say, what was that you said? And they go, oh, nothing. That is an unfair premise because they are refusing to allow someone to defend themselves. And it's important to note that if you're in the audience and hearing this, you, you should not think less of the person, you know, one person is criticizing the other. You shouldn't, but then refusing to allow them to defend themselves. You shouldn't think less of the other person because they've been criticized. You should actually think less of the first person for fighting cheap and taking a cheap shot. There, the, another good, oh, I had another example of that that I wanted to talk about. Um, anytime someone is passive aggressive, this is kind of what they're doing. They're trying to, you know, I thought you were going to work on that. Yeah, 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 I'll get, I'll get that done. And then they refuse to do it. They are refusing to do it because they don't think it's, it's necessary or serves their interest, but they're denying you the opportunity to be honest about it and have, uh, uh, have defend their, your, um, to defend your, how shall I put this? 
they're denying you the opportunity to explain yourself or have a conversation about it. Um, also, there's a lot of people who do the, uh, I call it the joke that's not really a joke. They're like, hey, you're really, you're really putting on the pounds, ha, ha, ha. And then if they get mad about that, they're like, whoa, what's the problem? I was just kidding. Real, when in fact, reality, in reality, they were trying to take a cheap shot there. So those are all examples of uh, denying someone the uh, right to defend themselves. You also want to avoid, it's easy to slip into a vicious spiral. This is sort of a Hatfields and McCoy scenario where perhaps there's something that was done that might seem like an infraction or in, in an ambiguous situation it is interpreted as a, an insult or an offense or, or something. And so you immediately respond in kind in, in a greater level of hostility rather than try and determine why they did that, why something was done to you, why something was said to you. And what happens is if you, it becomes a tit for tat, you interpret it as negative, which causes them to respond, which causes you to respond negatively, which causes them to respond to you negatively. And now you're sure they're out to get you because they've done two things to you. And so it becomes a vicious spiral. And I think it's important to note that sometimes people have different impulses here. Some people have an impulse uh, very defensive who want to escalate conflict whenever it happens and other people try to resolve it and you should sort of know where your calibration is and you can go wrong in either direction the vicious spiral is when you escalate it unnecessarily but trying to resolve something with someone who means you ill is not necessarily effective we'll get into that uh, a little bit later and the last thing I want to talk about is it's easy to get into a fight uh, if there is a conflict, you're fighting about something that the fight is not about. And the reality is you want to fight about the, the actual subject. I'll give you an example to illustrate this by an example. Um, a, uh, you know, I once saw a, a husband ask his wife to do something. Could you pass the salt? And she's like, why don't you get your own salt? Now, clearly, she wasn't offended by the fact that he asked her to pass the salt. There was something else that had happened between them that she was angry at, and she was taking it out on him uh, in that way. And I always say that's unhealthy because if you're not openly addressing the, the issue, you can't resolve it. If you're just create, doing diversionary tactics, um, something never gets, re it'll never get resolved. Uh, another example of that is I, uh, there was some people I worked with and, and they were on a conference call and they ended up getting in a fight. And most of us, are, we didn't understand what the fight was about because it seemed unnecessary and trivial. And I later came to find out that they had a history of conflicts. And whenever they got into a conflict, they got into a vicious, it became a vicious spiral because they were really angry about a, other, a lot of other things in the past that they'd never resolved. So those are some bad habits. Now let's talk about the ugly. These are areas where I think people are genu genuinely inspired to manipulate you. And I want to figure out how to defend yourself against such things. Um, one, the first example is the trap question. Like, are you still a liar? If you say yes, then it implies that you are a liar. If you say no, then it implies that you have been a liar in the past. There's no good answer for that. And a lot of manipulative people try to um, cultivate questions and scenarios where there's no upside no matter what you answer. And, and much like we talked about with uh, conflict, there you have a variety of responses. You can agree, you can disagree, but you can also, uh, or, or you can answer it, but you can also challenge the premise. Like, I don't know that I've ever been a liar. Now that's, in my case, I've given you a really simple case, so it's easy to do, but if you get into complex policy issues, business practice issues, politics, it's, uh, it, it, it's a little trickier to sort of take a step back, and especially if you're playing to an audience, you're trying to inform an audience, um, persuade an audience uh, to, to step back and, and explain to the audience that they're really trying to trap you, sort of illustrate that. You can also call them out by, by saying, Why, you're, you're asking me a trick question. Now that, again, makes it explicit to the audience, but they might just say, no, 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 I thought that's what it was. In, in which case, that you will be perceived by the audience as the hostile party. So that's a trickier um, threshold to meet. And it's important to note, manipulative people try and cultivate situations like that, where if you challenge their, you know, if you answer the question, you're uh, sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you answer their question either way, it, it reflects poorly on you. But if you challenge them openly, uh, it reflects ill on you because they're, you're seeming hostile and they'll try and act like they didn't mean it that, that way, even though we both know they did. Um, an another example, you could do some of the other things like change the subject, you can leave, we talked about that. Um, uh, another trick here is you can answer the question that you wanted them to ask. Like, is it true this car is unreliable? I'm glad you asked me about this car. Let me tell you how good the fuel efficiency is on this car. Um, that's, that's sort of a dodge, the artful dodge there. Um, and you can also answer the question with a question. 
are you a liar? You go, well, do you think I'm, are you calling me a liar? Are you still a liar? To which you could say, are you, are you calling me a liar? And then it sort of plays that game back on them. Likewise, when you, uh, when you uh, sort of walk away or, or, or leave, you can always say something like, you have a nice day, which makes it sound like you're being kind to them, but in reality, it's illustrating to everyone that you feel you've been, they've insulted you. Um, but those last two things, like uh, a question with a question and, and uh, you know, you have a nice day and walking away, you could argue that those are also refusing that, you sort of acu implying that they're doing something without uh, openly stating it and you're refusing to give them the opportunity to defend yourself. So there's a question there as to are you giving them their just desserts or is this a case of two wrongs making a right because you've turned the tables on them, but maybe that's not the high-minded thing to do. Um, another thing I want to talk about are uh, dealing with braggarts. There's often time, we talk here, here a little bit about, you know, are you informing versus bragging and are you using information as a guise to, to boast? Uh, that, that's one possibility. There's uh, some other tricks. I like the, uh, um, the and, and that's what I call the uh, in it for you. They'll sort of, like that motivational speaker who will uh, tell you about how all of his amazing accomplishments and then say, I'm just sharing this with you for your benefit. Um, I also like some of the things where people try and conceal it as a boasting um, uh, and in fact, it's even more boastful. So for example, if I say, look, I've made my money and now I'm just doing this for your interest. That sounds humble, but it's actually humility as a, as a disguise. What it really is is saying, not only am I rich and successful, I'm also quite generous. That's a double brag. Um, another example of that is people might say, might sort of try and imply that it's a secret. You know, let me tell you how much money I made on this deal. Now the reality is that's them boasting, but they're cr trying to keep it a secret imply but by trying to keep it a secret it implies that they're doing they're they're trying to do you a favor and therefore if you think of them as bragging or accuse them of bragging they'll be defended like hey i was just trying to let you in on the right so the uh, another and, and i got a couple other examples under bragging one of them is people who complain about how much something costs to show you how rich they are like these sort of the classic is oh my gosh the the jet fuel from, ah, oh, the price is so high, it's killing me on my Learjet, you wouldn't believe it. My Gulfstream, I can, oh, it's eating me out of house. This is a way of saying, not only, this is a double brag, not only am I rich enough to have a jet, I'm also grounded and have the sense of the value of the dollar. And uh, a final example for that one is, people oftentimes say, look, the, the guy stole $2 million from me. I mean, I don't care about the money, I'm in it for the, I, I want to challenge him on the general principle, which says, not only am I real, uh, rich enough to have that much money to lose, but I'm also highly principled. So that's a double brag as well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, another manipulative element, which is um, using your sense of obligation against you. So for example, uh, if, some, if so, someone who uh, wants something from you comes up and puts their hand out to shake it, they're essentially, you know, they will present this as I would, as a sincere attempt to meet you, but if they're trying to manipulate you. Um, I've seen some beggars do this kind of trick. Uh, what, what they're really doing is they're using your feeling of obligation to, sh to, to shake an extended hand because to not shake a hand is an offensive act. And, and like I said, the manipulative are always interested in creating and cultivating scenarios where if you don't do what they want, it will make you the bad guy. You will be the heavy and other people will think that you've done something wrong. Um, another example of that is where uh, someone might ask you a question using your comp compulsion to answer a question against you. Uh, there's a, some, uh, at a trade shows, there's a company that sells shoe insoles and they never come up to you and say, would you like to hear about our shoe insoles? Because you could say no. But what they'll do is they'll say, what's your shoe size? Because that's a question that traps you into it. Now, if you refuse to answer, um, the, 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 the question doesn't give you the option of not answering like a yes or no question was. And so they're trying to use that, uh, the obligation you feel to not be rude and answer an open question against you uh, it, to trick you into hearing their sales pitch. Um, another example of this is oftentimes people will try and deliberately, who want to sell you something, will spend time with you. So that you and they will deliberately try and elongate the amount of time and go to effort to show you the details because they think that that way it will create a sense of obligation. You, you won't, it'll be harder for you to just walk away be, and then they will act un, like you've treated them ungratefully. And that brings to, uh, so that, that is uh, an example of using your, uh, those are examples of using your obligation against you. And one of the things that I think is particularly uh, negative about that is it really, it, it's a terrible thing to do because it creates an incentive for the world to no longer feel obligated to anyone. So if they use your sense of courtesy to manipulate you, it gives you an incentive to not be courteous anymore. And I think that that's sort of terrible. I talk a little bit about that in my integrity speech and I call that the universality element, where if everybody did it, it would actually 
uh, make the world a worse place. But that last example I gave you about trying to cultivate a sense of obligation so they can seem offended if you don't do what they ask you to do, that, there's a certain element of theatrics to that. And that's uh, a couple of other examples of that was what I call the Shirley, where someone says, surely you've heard of my product, and you'll say, no, I haven't heard it. Oh, well, let me explain it to you. And it's created the illusion that um, uh, they're, they're, sh they're, they're surprised that you've never heard of it. And I've heard this a couple of times in my life where they, they mention, well, surely you've heard of, and then they mention some product that nobody would reasonably assume that they've heard of. That's just their theatrics to try and, it's a sort of a bullying tactic to try and make you feel um, like you're missing out and that they have something to tell you. And that way when they give you their pitch, it's like they're pretending that they're doing you the favor by informing you of something you need to know. Um, another theatrical thing that people do is they, they ask that you're, um, you're silly for questioning, like, look, I've never done business with this company before. How, is, how reliable are they? Like, oh, you don't need to worry about reliability with us. My name's Keith White, and you know for a fact that you can take that to the bank. It's, it's insulting you for even asking to make you feel self-conscious about it. Uh, and a final example for theatrics is, uh, you know, the classic guy uh, dating a younger woman in school. He's always like, uh, hey, come on, what are you... <laughs> what, are you, what are you uptight? Why, aren't you, why don't you want to come back to my place? And that's, that's the at attempt to make them feel like there's something wrong with them, to put the, puts the burden on them for, uh, uh, for saying no. And the last element of manipulation I want to talk about, at least for the sample, is talking about people who act in bad faith. You know, they'll often try and say, hey, let's get together and talk about it. What's the harm in talking? But there are actually several harms that can happen if they're manipulative people who aren't genuinely interested in coming to some sort of agreement, they're acting in bad faith, and, and you might just decide to avoid a meeting with them. Um, so for example, if, uh, and some tips of that is, th the listening to your side is cursory. They sit there and they listen patiently, and then when they start talking, they just completely ignore it. They were trying to cultivate a, a feel, they were trying to give you the illusion that this is cooperative, when in fact they have no intention of actually uh, meeting any of your terms. Uh, another example is, they will try to, uh, any, anytime you have, uh, the, the other problem is that oftentimes listening to your side, they're pretending as if they're listening to your side because they want to hear what you have to say and they respect your judgment. But in reality, they're listening to your side so that they will have a list of things that they can contradict with you or perhaps even you know, to both your bosses uh, if it's an office politics kind of situation. And um, another uh, reason that you wouldn't want to meet with someone acting in bad faith is by meeting with them, you just give them another opportunity to talk you out of it. There's not, it's not like you're actually going to make a point and they're going to say, oh, that's a good point. Um, oftentimes, they'll also, you'll notice no matter what you say, they always counter it with a point, and then you say, well, that's not true because this, and then they have another counter, and, and eventually you'll realize they're never going to agree. They're just, they're just using this as an illusion to knock, the, knock the, every time you come up with a, a response, they'll have a counter response, and the purpose for that is to, uh, uh, you'll realize you're not getting anywhere. This is just all a charade. So with that in mind, let's move on a little bit. Those are some of the manipulative elements. Let us, oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to say on acting in bad faith. Another problem with engaging people acting in bad faith is uh, oftentimes they will, they will uh, get you to say something that you regret and then they will immediately tell everyone else about that. That's, that's sort of the trap. And that's p particularly important if they don't have a reputation to lose but you do. So for example, you'll see a lot of, uh, uh, oftentimes a reporter from, from a small news agency will say something provocative to a, a, a politician to get them to say something. And if, the, if nobody says anything, if, if they don't say something uh, that they regret, it's no big deal because nobody's heard of this reporter. But if they do, all of a sudden, uh, you know, they get, a, they get a scoop. And because they don't have, nobody, you know, people who have not been heard of don't have a reputation to lose, whereas you as a politician or business leader might. So let's move on from the manipulative to sort of the questionable. These are some more philosophical ones. Um, you know, we, we've talked about some bad habits and some ugly manipulative tactics, but it's important to note that just because someone is doing something that could be perceived as manipulative, you don't necessarily know that. And so you have to decide who are you going to give the benefit of the doubt to. And the, the mistake you can make in either direction is if you're too passive, you will enable manipulative people to get away with uh, some of their tactics. But if you're always uh, challenging everyone who might 
per, per, might be acting in bad faith, you will be hyper vigilant and you'll be starting fights that don't necessarily need to be fought. Um, and you will be embarrassing yourself in front of others because you will seem like a conflict seeker. And, but, and that's a real trick because manipulative people will always try and craft scenarios where if you challenge them, even if they are mean ill, uh, you, will, you will lose your reputation, not them. You will be looked at as the heavy or the bad guy. Another questionable area is you've got to ask yourself is what if someone's taking something that is a, a position that's silly or presenting facts that you believe to be untrue, um, do you challenge them on that? Now we've talked about there's some diplomatic ways of challenging them, but do you want to, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you don't challenge them, then the world could become a wor worse place because in theory, bad information is being propagated. But if you do challenge them, you run the risk of your being the bad guy. And so you wanna sort of, you gotta ask yourself that question about whether or not you wanna challenge, and if so, how to do so diplomatically. Um, another example that you wanna, you have to make some decisions about is how much deference you show other people or your audience. If you show them too much def if you show them not enough deference, you will be considered entitled or ungrateful. But if you show them too much deference, you might get taken advantage of because it communicates to them that you are a per uh, you you that they are superior to you and they act on your and, and, and they must serve you must serve their interests. And the last one I want to talk about uh, questionable is just the example of you know some might say this is a really questionable one. Uh, because if someone pr prefaces a statement by saying, some might say, some might say, this is uh, what you've done is wrong. Now, it's debatable as to whether or not this is dodging, by saying some might say, are they dodging personal responsibility? Because it sounds like that's their position, in which case they would be hostile to you. But the other possibility is they're saying some might say to allow you to save face. They're, they're putting it more diplomatically. They're putting it on a third party so that you have the ability to diminish them without causing a direct conflict. And I don't know if that's, uh, so you can say that either meaning well or meaning ill, either way. So that's basically some, uh, some tips from my conversation on interaction, sort of teaching hopefully people to manage uh, inter uh, interactions, uh, manage conflicts, avoid conflicts, and uh, tell whether or not people mean well or not. I hope you found this illustrative. If you'd like something like this presented, please contact me at my website, keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.